Thank you for coming out on a, such a cold and snowy night. I'm finding you're all, all, your way all the way downtown. Um, I, I know some of you come, come back for more. I'm going to talk shorter this time than I did last time for sure. Um, and um, I welcome you for the sort of third of these investigations of the um, invention and evolution of New York modernism. Um, in the night, in a, a close examination at American architecture in New York through the skyscraper um, in the 1920s. And as you know, um, those of you who've been with the first two lectures, an uh, overview that looks at, um, apropos of the exhibition, the idea of the city of the future being the, um, a definition of the direction that modern architecture will go in the 1920s. Um, Harvey Wiley Corbett and this phrase of a famous um, series of uh, articles that he wrote for the Saturday Evening Post in 1926, New Stones for Old, um, is a figure that sort of bridges um, very much between the old and the new. He's um, the oldest of the uh, key figures in the exhibition and the architects that I see as really key to sort of formulating both the theory and the image of an American modernism that's released through the, through the skyscraper in, in the 1920s. Um, he was uh, born in, in 1873, which makes him a few years older than, than Frank Lloyd Wright. He's of the, the generation, um, certainly older than Ferris and, and Hood, who are the two other sort of key figures that that we're looking at, um, and of the generation uh, of the sort of previous scions of, uh, um, of, of American architecture, so the, the Thomas Hastings and, the, and Carrere. Uh, the, uh, he worked for McKim, Mead, and White, uh, so you know, he was clearly of a, of a younger in-between generation, but he, he, he evolved out of this kind of old school, indeed the Ecole des Beaux-Arts old school, where he um, attended um, the Ecole uh, after having graduated from Berkeley um, in, in 1895 with a degree in engineering. So he came from uh, a, a West Coast um, uh, heritage, uh, a, a pair of parents who were both doctors, so I have a, a mother who was a doctor, very unusual um, for, the, for that generation, um, and um, a, a, a bit of nonconformists actually, with an engineering background going to the font of all architectural creation, Paris, the Ecole des Beaux-Arts, um, and then coming back to the United States in 1910 where he, he, he came to work in a, a series of offices as a draftsman. So following the typical pattern of um, a, an architect trained in classicism, accustomed to to the kind of civic um, commissions, the institutional um, architecture of grandeur of the of the turn of the century, of progressive, of the progressive era. Um, but he's someone who who, who looked ahead um, in his thinking about urbanism and, and about the life of the city um, in a way that that. Um, I think is quite extraordinary, and he, he led the way as a progressive through through um, more through his writings um, than through his his buildings. And indeed, we'll not look at that many buildings uh, today. Can I have the, the next um, image, uh, which is a uh, um, picture of Ferret of Corbett um, uh, later um, in his life in his in his fifties? He died in 1954, um, and um, and he and he led the way through uh, a series of, through being a, a professor at Columbia, through uh, having many students that came to his studio from the, uh, in the Columbia system of studying outside of the university in, the, in an atelier as, uh, as one did in the model they called a Beaux-Arts. Um, he was a, um, an, an open-minded thinker, uh, attuned to the, the life of the city and the kinds of business commissions, because he was a definitely a businessman architect like Raymond Hood that we'll, we'll talk about next time. Um, but he, he wrote in 1923, um, when he first became involved with the Regional Plan Association um, of New York and its environs, uh, as, as one of the architects committee, as one of the sort of senior architects, a man of great stature, stature and seniority. Um, but 
he became engaged in the idea of the life of the city and how to solve its problems. And he wrote, um, as an architect grows, grows older and more practiced in his profession, his eyes turn naturally to the metropolis as the broadest field of expression. Um, and it's, it's in this area of, of urbanism that I think that uh, Corbett really leads the way to the, uh, to the thinking and a definition about what modern architecture will be. Um, it's a particular kind of modern architecture because at the end um, of the 1920s, uh, in 1932, when he goes to the a symposium for the international style um, Museum of Modern Art um, exhibition, um, he, he writes, um, and I think I have that here at the end, um, that uh, he says he, he sees it as, as an old man, um, that his eyes aren't accustomed um, to such designs. Uh, and um, he, um, I won't fi find the exact quote. Oh, but I, I think um, that you see that I'm speaking as an older man who has been through a lot, who's been through the mill, and who has been proud of the fact that he could make an Italian an Italian palace, four stories high, um, for a bank, um, and do it rather ingenuously. Having done all these things, the exhibition of this kind makes me think, uh, comes to me as something of a shock. So a modernism um, that, that Corbett um, defines through an approach to the city uh, and through, uh, through some of his buildings, the next place, um, that, is, uh, that, that sets uh, a, a new direction in the early 1920s. And it's for this reason, for his, in, for his inventions of the, of the early 20s, of 1923, 24, of um, um, his Bush building of, uh, of 1917, that he, um, he really establishes himself as a modernist. Um, the pages from the Saturday Evening Post, you see these well-worn pages um, from the, uh, the, the Columbia Butler Library deteriorating volume. Um, here's, here's Corbett uh, receiving a medal. Um, he was um, much honored in, by many architectural uh, organizations, including the RIBA. Uh, in, uh, in London, where he received a gold medal. Uh, and that's his, his portrait from that. But um, this three, three, three article series of new stones for old starts with showing you some of the older stones, as we, as we will here, the Metropolitan Life Tower, the Woolworth Building, um, and the new ones that are rising um, in the place. Hood's American Radiator Building, Bush's, uh, uh, Corbett's Bush Building, um, the next place. Uh, and the, these old stones um, look look old to our eyes when we start to think of them as a, as the previous generation, the first skyscrapers, Woolworth Building, world's tallest building in, in 1913. But in this particular slide, where it shows um, the dirt of the city and the um, the, the 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 lines and the um, detail of its its Gothic ornament, it seems to be um, clearly uh, a connection to the past. Uh, and the next, please. It's a pre-zoning building, just as the um, equitable building at 120 Broadway uh, establishes in its classicism, but in its, its bulky, um, massive, um, hulking form, uh, 40 stories high, built over every single inch of the lot, um, broken in its form only by a light court, which is necessary to illuminate the, the, the workspace within. Um, it represents this generation of the laissez-faire growth of, of the skyscraper um, that Corbett would, would begin to react against and indeed um, became the sort of principal definer uh, about the, the new direction uh, of architecture um, that was promised promised by zoning. Um, the next place. So in, uh, and uh, the, the crowding of the towers with their, um, not only their masonry old stones, uh, but their, uh, their references to historical styles uh, is um, something that as the 20s progressed, and Corbett began um, to, uh, to, to see as, uh, as symbols or representations of the past. And he begins to, to write about zoning. The, um, the next, please. We'll look first at his Bush building. Uh, uh, a 1917 uh, 
completion of the building, so it's, it gets its permits before 1916, before the 1916 zoning law comes into place. So it's a, a building which isn't governed by the setback rules, um, but it is determined very much by this new attitude that, uh, that Corbett talks about of a, a building that's designed with four faces. Um, we see it across Bryant Park, so with the leafage um, and looking, rising rather like a, a Gothic church tower, um, maybe across an English green. Um, it, it certainly has the, the, the Gothic um, sort of tracery effects and the detail that makes reference to that, that English Gothic style. Um, but um, in the next one, please. Uh, we see um, in its form um, a, a very erect skyscraper um, built uh, at, because it could only be squeezed onto this narrow lot, um, and uh, I think 75 feet wide, um, most of the block long, and rising sheer for I think 32 stories. In fact, um, Corbett was able to get the top two floors for his own offices. Uh, so was, uh, he, he would have this uh, airy to, to survey the um, surrounding um, uh, growing uh, uh, sort of tumultuous growth of, of Times Square um, because this building rises on 42nd Street just west of, of 6th Avenue. Um, the Bush building was the, the Bush, um, like the Bush terminal in Brooklyn um, was a Bush was an importing company, and this was a building that was created for buyers, uh, so that they were showroom floors, uh, which meant that they didn't need the uh, the high quality of light with windows all around. So this blank face of the building that could rise straight up, where the windows were only on the um, to illuminate from the from the the 42nd Street frontage, um, made it an, a very unusual um, commission, uh, and um, the. As, as you can see, it rising on 42nd Street, it really was a kind of um, beacon of a new, new architecture seen as a sculptural object, seen with um, all four faces around. Uh, but with this, the blank wall, the next place, of the um, shadow brick, it was, as it was called, um, something that Corbett claimed to have um, invented, uh, using the colored brick, and this became then a feature of much of the 1920s architecture, um, to give a, a kind of um, uh, column-like or, or uh, decorative uh, verticality as if there were th there's a, a three-dimensionality of shade and shadow play but just executed in the, in the colored brick. Um, and so these are the floors that um, would have been, I guess, um, the offices of, uh, of Corbett's architectural um, office in the very top floors of the Bush building. The next, please. Uh, the, um, another Bush building in London, and uh, designed by uh, Corbett and uh, rendered by Hugh Ferris in this case, show his attachment to classicism um, as well as to uh, his reference to the Gothic. Uh, the commissions during this time when he was um, practicing, I'll give you the years of his practice with um, Pell first, um, uh, F. Livingston Pell from 1903 to 1912. So by the time we got to the Bush Building, he was already practicing with um, his partner Frank J. Helmley um, from uh, from 1912 and and through the 20s. Uh, they worked on a series of commissions um, in well, really well beyond uh, New York. The Springfield Municipal Group. Um, uh, in Baltimore, another classical building. Um, they worked on commissions of, of large scale, civic scale, um, at least for, for small cities. Um, and after the Bush Building, did no skyscrapers actually until um, until the late 1920s. Um, the next, please. Uh, he tried uh, in um, his competition for the Chicago Tribune um, 1922 competition that was, of course, won by Raymond Hood. And as you can see from uh, Corbett's design, uh, the reference to the Gothic, uh, it's a design that I have, I have to say, is a, you know, from my, my perspective, it's, it's a kind of a, a, a mess. It's a pastiche of um, lots of different um, pieces with, uh, with tiny little windows that have a sort of waffle iron um, effect. And then the sort of wedding cake on top of it um, is um, 
is quite a contradiction to the rhetoric that surrounded the, the Bush building. In fact, I have some of his, his phrases for, um, to describe the Bush building. Um, he says, what we are, what are you getting now? Um, no, he said, um, we are determined that, um, that, that the, the tower should be a thing complete in itself with fine, clean, uprising lines, a building that could be looked at from every angle, sides and back, as well as front. And then, um, uh, and then he he, uh, he comes up with the um, Tribune competition uh, drawing that uh, that has a, a kind of decorativeness to it that um, is exactly the opposite the next place um, of uh, the winning entry of Hood, which used um, in, where, where Hood used exactly the same language that Bush that. Um, that the Bush terminal was described um, by Corbett. Um, the building um, being uh, a single thing, rising as, um, as, as one tower, unified um, um, not only by the, the vertical lines, but by the banding of the window, so they're treated um, as uh, linearly as they rise in the facade and then sort of culminate through a series of, of piers um, that, that crown the building and sort of hold the whole design together. That, that same idea of the building being one thing, um, that, w that was the reason that the Bush terminal, built, the, that the Bush building, the Bush tower, was thought to be so important by the colleagues of the time, was the description that was used to, de to, um, uh, to, des to describe the, the modernity, um, even uh, with the Gothic uh, style of Hood's uh, winning uh, Tribune Tower competition. The next, please. Uh, it was also the language that was used for this um, probably even more admired uh, uh, entry, the second prize winner, by Elil Saarinen, the Finnish architect. Um, a, a, a drawing uh, that was much admired by uh, critics in the architectural press and many, many architects, and probably um, including um, Corbett, because much of Corbett's uh, design work, at least through the through sort of drawn description of urbanism, seems to pay some reference to the ideas of, of Saarinen. Um, but as 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 rendered, as in, as interpreted um, by Hugh Ferris, who became the kind of um, vehicle for um, for Corbett's um, uh, urban vision um, visionary schemes. The next place we'll look at some um, some more uh, Saarinen um, in a moment. Uh, but the, this 1922 uh, event uh, of the Chicago Tribune competition has had um, an overwhelming influence on the architectural uh, community. It was a huge, uh, a huge prize uh, winner. It was um, competed by hundreds, uh, seven, couple hundred, more than a couple hundred architects. So it, it was, um, it was the talk of the town. It was the talk of not more than the town. It was the it, the, the talk of the international circuit of architects, and it, it won um, a tremendous amount of, of publicity, um, certainly for the, for the winners and for the. Uh, for the newspaper that sponsored it, um, and it became a kind of, of legendary event um, through the, the 1920s for historians who used it as a kind of um, test case in order to look at the spectrum, as we did in previous um, in, in previous talks, of the, um, the range of designs of retarded terror designs by American architects and of avant-garde designs um, by Europeans like um, Gropius and uh, Max Tout and um, uh, to some extent, Adolf Loos uh, and the and, and the Dutch architects. Um, so, 1922 is a is a key year for for interpreting American architecture for the reason um, traditionally of the Chicago Tribune competition. But as I have argued before in the last couple of of talks, and especially with Ferris, 1922 was also the date of um, these um, drawings, of this article, but especially these drawings, which I think are the most important drawings um, in American architecture of this decade. And there are um, Hugh Ferris's four stages of the zoning envelope um, that he published. He was the first to publish them in the New York Times here in March 19th, 1922. So um, in, in these drawings, um, which uh, uh, Ferris made for Cor Corbett's commission, 
uh, or I at, at Corbett's invitation for the um, Architects Committee of the Regional Plan. So in 1923 and 24, um, Ferris. Um, illustrates the conception of, of Corbett of these monumental towers like this coming city of setback skyscrapers that, that he wrote about with arcaded streets with loges like a, uh, like a, a gracious sunlit Italian plaza with uh, um, uh, Greek temples um, at, the, at the setback levels of a, a kind of um, civilization in, in the sky where, uh, where the sort of strolling street life is separated from uh, the, uh, the, the turmoil and the sort of uh, teeming traffic of, uh, of the urban streets below. The next, next please. Um, oh, that one. Let, let's go back well, uh, for a moment while I, I read a little bit of, of how he evoked um, this, this future city that he saw as early as 1923-24. Um, he, he says um, that in, um, well, actually, I'll, I'll read this later because it probably goes better with, the, with the, these same drawings as we see them um, in a, in, in another article. The, the next please, we'll go on and, and we'll look at the, um, the precedents for some of these ideas uh, that may have come from an architect that Corbett knew, who was uh, a friend uh, of an older generation, Charles Rowlandson Lamb, who was of the Lamb family of the Lamb Studios, ecclesiastical um, furniture and artwork was their um, bread and butter, and Charles Rowlandson Lamb was um, a, a visionary of the the same um, kind of wide, um, uh, wild, wide and wild uh, imagination um, as Corbett. Back in 1898, um, he imagined a, a reformed municipal building, as you can see behind City Hall, um, as, a, as a kind of, of megastructure, uh, a, a super-scaled municipal building before we have the municipal building that we have today, um, that would rise up as a series of, of setbacks of the tower emerging from the center. Um, the next, please. Um, and uh, in uh, another version in a drawing that was, uh, wasn't published but is in the, was given to Avery Library, um, you see uh, uh, another version behind uh, a cleared out City Hall Park um, with um, a, uh, a skyscraper that really looks like it belongs to the 1920s rather than 1898, which is the, the date of some of these, um, these investigations of, of Lamb. Um, he, w he was interested and he endorsed skyscrapers at a time when they were roundly denounced by any um, self-respecting uh, Beaux-Arts um, uh, type gentleman architect. Um, the next please. Uh, but he was also particular, oh, and, and in, in indeed um, in the, in the the um, architecture that, the only architecture that he ever realized, which was the um, Dewey Arch at, uh, at Madison Square, a temporary plaster arch that was um, erected to, to celebrate Admiral, Admiral Dewey, Dewey's um, triumphs. Uh, and it was uh, it, with um, uh, uh, Bailey, I think, is the, uh, is the sculptor that collaborated. Uh, but uh, but Lamb, um, Lamb had had no buildings to uh, to his his credit, um, he, but he had these fantastic um, urban designs that he uh, propounded through a series of the, his drawings, but also in writings um, in um, in uh, in well-known civic uh, um, uh, uh, civic magazines. Um, so he he did have a following. Next place. Um, but he was he was over the top um, in his suggestions. Here you see the Singer Building and City Investing um, uh, with um, the with Broadway. Um, actually, Broadway would be cutting through here, I guess. Um, where this idea of streets in the air and separating the pedestrians from the teeming traffic below, um, you can see he, he's exploring with a kind of um, rooftop uh, um, promenade and a, and a series of, of uh, pedestrian bridges. The next place. This is um, something that um, 
is explored in the imaginations of King's Views, for example, here in the, in the exhibition, uh, where bridges connect the buildings at their upper levels and multiple levels of, of wheeled and pedestrian um, traffic and, uh, and transit uh, um, fill Broadway below. Here's the Singer building in, in the background there also. Um, and this idea that I've argued before is the turn of the century idea of the city of the future uh, before zoning, which, just, which simply extrapolates from the technology and the um, congestion of the present, uh, an unregulated growth that sees the skyscraper as, um, as, as rampant uh, and, uh, and uncontrollable. Um, the, next, the next please. Um, and, uh, and, those, and the ideas that, then, that Lamb advanced um, belong to a whole series of um, sorry, interested, um, technological, uh, um, te te technological inventions um, uh, and suggestions uh, that focus on solving traffic congestion. And they're precedents that Corbett um, seems, to, seems to have known, uh, not only with Lamb, but even with this drawing of one of the early um, ideas to bridge Broadway, this is long before we had uh, an IRT, um, the idea of putting the, the wheeled transit below and the pedestrians uh, bridged ab ab above here on Broadway to separate um, for the safety of and the uh, sunshine uh, experience uh, and also to accommodate the incredible congestion of, that was um, growing everywhere in the city. Uh, um, the next please. So th there's a whole series of these um, proposals. Um, one sees them here in the exhibition from the, the uh, World Magazine where uh, um, lighter than aircraft and then eventually airplanes are being added to the seven levels of transit that New York is, is already experiencing. So this um, kind of um, uh, you know, obs obsessive interest uh, in accommodating uh, the advances of modern technology uh, is, has its whole lineage and Ferris belongs um, in many ways um, to, uh, to, to many of these enthusiastic investigations and embrace of uh, flying machines and all that you see uh, on the roofs of skyscrapers. Uh, the next please. Uh, and just uh, some of the cartoons on the top of the Singer building again with netting so that people are flying or buzzing around in the air and they fall down there um, saved by the, the nets that are they're slung between skyscraper uh, tops. The next please. Uh, uh, some, some more of the lamb images um, with uh, these proposals for bridges and setbacks. So uh, at a time before there really was any, um, well, much, there, there, there was a, a little bit of, of um, sort of political, um, um, uh, political agitation for zoning back at the, the, the turn of the century in New York, and Lamb belonged to a, a, a small group that was trying to work out those, those problems. Uh, but uh, there was certainly no prescription for a uh, setback or these upper level um, sidewalks and, and the bridging. This was um, simply a sort of technological um, suggestion of how to solve some of the, the problems of the congestion of the streets. The next please. And um, more setback skyscrapers and one of the, the few people, Lamb was, one of the few people that was making suggestions of, of changing, uh, altering the skyscraper form in order to accommodate this multi-level movement of the city. The next, please. And Corbett was uh, was aware uh, and was friends with Lamb and was aware of these drawings, as were many people, because here it was published in the in the New York World, um, the saving the sunshine in the city's um, valley of shade. So you see uh, Lamb's reformed city. Uh, on the left-hand side and the sort of King's views of extrapolated um, congestion on the right. The next, please. The uh, drawing that's often associated with uh, Corbett and is attributed in scholarship to the uh, Scientific American in 19, I think, 13, 14, but I've looked through every page of the Scientific American in 19, 13, 14, and this drawing is, isn't there. Uh, but it clearly belongs to the, uh, to the same, um, the same uh, 
plans and proposals that, uh, that Lamb was generating and was one of the few people uh, doing those kinds of investigations. So it probably has something to do with Lamb. It, was, it became embraced as a kind of popular culture uh, uh, vision of a future city and working out the accommodation of congestion. And here you see um, all of those multiple levels and all of the bridges and the, and the rooftop setbacks. Um, this is something that's, that's often um, associated with, with um, Corbett, but if anybody can solve the problem about, what, about its origins, I would be very happy to, um, to learn that. The next, please. And so, so Corbett himself um, comes uh, uh, in this, this line from the turn of the century, people like Lamb, the investigators of um, technological, uh, contraptions and ways to turn tech, uh, turn technology uh, to, into some kind of ordered uh, artery flow of the uh, multiple levels of, of city circulation. Uh, in this particular drawing, you can see how, how closely it conforms to the, this 20-year-old type that's been established, but you can also see the introduction of the influence of zoning as um, whole blocks of the city are taken over by a single uh, structure, a single megastructure. The next, please. Uh, and just to show a, a, a kindred spirit and, uh, in, in terms of the kind of interest of separating the levels of traffic, uh, but, a, a, but a connection to and sort of an, a, a, what, an attraction, a, um, a, you know, an unbreakable connection to the more historical styles. This is a project for the city of the future that was propounded by Ernest Flagg uh, in 1927 in the Scientific American. So the, um, uh, the architect of the, the Singer Building and a series of of uh, certainly of, of many urban um, buildings, continues to think not just architecturally but scientifically for the scientific of, uh, American of ways to solve the problems of the modern city. But he's he's attached to history in a way even in 1927 that um, that Corbett uh, where that Corbett starts starts to break. Um, the next, please. So in 1923-24, as I said, there's uh, um, this important event uh, in Corbett's life is participating in the Architects' com uh, Committee for the, uh, the Regional Plan of New York and its environs. And we saw the Ferris um, drawings um, before. Uh, they were used, the next please, to illustrate um, a whole series of articles. Uh, they were created for the regional plan, but, but Corbett used them himself in, uh, in four or five different articles. He used them in lectures that he took around town. He showed them at the Titan City exhibition at Wanamakers in 1925. He showed them in a whole series of um, other architectural exhibitions. And he, he um, really took us in a kind of missionary way um, this series of drawings and lander slides and articles where he made the argument that you could really reinvent the modern city with, through the help of zoning and through attention to um, channeling the, uh, the, the growth of the city into the logical separation of, uh, as he called it, foot, wheel, and rail. Uh, and he wrote in the, and let me have the next slide also, in the coming city of setback skyscrapers, he, he, he writes, well, and interrupt myself to say that this is something um, that had been explored already. Um, this is 57th Street and uh, Corbett was concentrating his architects committee on, on 57th Street. Uh, the, the, a set of loges that you recognize from his advocacy and also the separation not just of wheeled but of horse carted and wheeled um, vehicles from the City Improvement Commission um, back in uh, 19, it was started in 1904. The next please. Uh, and, uh, and then a, a, Corbett, a, a Corbett idea as, as drawn by Ferris. And so he wrote in this, the coming city of setback skyscrapers about the future of New York. He said, Manhattan would be a gathering point for all the agents of production and consumption. Things will no longer be made there. Um, there will be no room for factories, um, but they will be bought and sold there in offices conveniently grouped um, through, through, deal, through deals personally transacted. 
Office buildings will increase in number, as will hotels and apartments. The theater and the centers of the arts will all hold their own. In fact, they'll grow in, in, in importance as New York becomes more and more an international city. Next, please. Um, this urban vision um, that uh, he develops in 23, 24, and he advocates relentlessly through 1925, 26, and, and 27 um, in e these exhibitions um, and articles and a series of debates that he holds um, in public and um, in, uh, in the press, and especially in the New York Times, as you'll see later. Um, all, all envision a future city of monumental setback skyscrapers, uh, of leisurely promenades, of sunlit plazas where pedestrians are separated from the, uh, from the dangers of, of the street, and where all vehicles um, flow uh, um, uh, seamlessly uh, and, uh, uh, and effortlessly um, in, in, a, in a city that's reformed um, by, by zoning and where, and where technology is, is channeled um, uh, by, by city planning. Um, the the next please um, well the urban center actually go back to this one and I'll read a little bit more of um, some of uh, Corbett's eloquence um, where he compares um, this uh, vision of the of the city to um, to Venice uh, and uh, the separation of the canals like the streets from the open plazas he, see, he sees um, a future New York where. Um, we see a city of sidewalks arcaded within the building lines uh, and one story above present grade. We see bridges on all corners, the width of the arcades with solid railings. We see the smaller parks of the city, of which there will be many, um, and more than present, raised to the same sidewalk arcade level. Public parking spaces for autos being provided underneath. The whole aspect becomes that of a very modernized Venice, a city of arcades, piazzas, and bridges with canals for streets. Only canals will not be filled with water but with freely moving motor traffic. The sun glittering on the black tops of cars and the, and the buildings reflecting, uh, re reflecting in the waving flood of the rapidly rolling vehicles. Venice is the adaptation of the city to the necessities of the terrain on which it is built. The New York of the future will be an adaptation of the metropolis to the needs of traffic, freeing the city from the unsightly congestion and turmoil of the present. Pedestrians will move through the arcaded streets out of the danger of traffic, protected from the snows of winter and the glare of the summer sun. Walking will be made more, a more pleasurable pastime um, and would cease to be one of the most hazardous of occupations. Shopping will be a joy, the overwrought nerves of the present New Yorker will be restored to normalcy, and the city will be the model for all the world. Uh, the next place. And it'll be gracious. Here's the, um, the art center uh, of a, and a drawing by Ferris that's in the exhibition um, for, uh, uh, that was done for the regional plan where you can see a, 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 a skyscraper backdrop and, a, and indeed a, a kind of Venetian doge's palace framing this, this um, uh, nightlit plaza uh, and with a, a monumentality and a graciousness of a, a grand um, civic order. Um, the next please. And in, in these articles, like the different levels um, uh, of foot, reel, wheel, and rail, um, here in actually 1924, um, in a serious city planning journal called The, the American City, um, illustrated by Hugh Ferris' um, descriptions of full blocks, um, setback skyscrapers. The next, please. Um, so we've now seen these a, a number of times. He um, seriously lays out all of the reforms and the, the um, steps by which uh, in a continuous, uh, continuously renewing city, which was the condition of New York in the 1920s, um, had by 1925 become the world's most populous city and it was replacing five and six story um, brownstones and row houses with skyscrapers. Um, uh, throughout Midtown and in, in practically every neighborhood, as we saw in the East 40s, um, views of all of the, the sort of terraced um, setback um, uh, mid-rise buildings just as, as the garment district was being reformed. So that everywhere you looked in New York, it was rebuilding itself um, uh, on every block. And, and Ferris, uh, 
Ferris illustrates what Corbett is uh, describing, how the um, 19th century uh, scale of the city could be um, incrementally replaced by these uh, um, building code regu regulations that re require setbacks, that would add bridges, that would unite each one of these um, setback skyscrapers into a, a, a continuous net network of gracious uh, superblock centers. The next, please. Next, yeah. Uh, and um, like the arcades that we saw at the Barclay Vesey uh, building, he, he shows how um, how new buildings are will will um, fit this this pattern as the um, the streets of Bologna have ar arcaded streets that are all built um, within a w within a harmonious era of architectural renewal. The next, please. Um, more, he, he advances these ideas every, at every opportunity, including uh, through the 1926 New Stones for Old Saturday Evening Post articles, so that you see them there. The next, please. Um, you see them in the planning journals. The next, please. Um, you, um, oh, and you, you see them in, in newspapers. Um, now, an, another project um, of um, this period is a kind of um, uh, wacky idea that, uh, um, that Corbett would normally get engaged in. Uh, his his uh, partner, um, Wally Harrison, described uh, from the later 1920s, described Fer uh, Corbett as uh, a, a guy who was a sucker for, for get-rich-quick schemes and for sort of wild ideas. Um, and this one, I don't think, would, would, ever brought him um, any inkling of fortune, but it, um, it must, must have appealed to um, some, uh, some sort of schizophrenic streak in his, in his character that wanted the world to be modern but was attached to these historical um, um, uh, extravaganzas. Uh, and this was for uh, the, the Philadelphia Sesquicentennial Exhibition that was um, held in Philadelphia in 1926. Uh, and uh, of course this was never realized but it was a multiple acre uh, uh, precinct that was to be a replica of King Solomon's um, temple and citadel. So this Acropolis uh, with Solomon's temple in the upper corner looking like a New York setback skyscraper uh, was to be a kind of uh, religious uh, Disneyland experience where um, in the next place um, you would go through a series of um, uh, pavilions uh, and um, uh, learn and uh, you know Experience uh, Bible stories uh, and uh, and pageants and recreations at every every point, and Solomon's Temple would burn down with uh, gas jets, uh, you know, two or three times a day um, in a in a very um, extravagant and and um, uh, didactic experience of uh, religious uh, um, fulfillment. Uh, uh, as you can see, the Helmley and Corbett architects were res uh, responsible for uh, the uh, archaeological character and also the Beaux-Arts um, drawing presentation of a, a reconstruction of Solomon's Temple in the forecourt that you see here. The next place. Um, it bears um, s some striking resemblance to Saarinen's lakefront project uh, and one wonders um, about the transference of, about some of the, not just the, the ideas between architects but, the, um, but across the ages in thinking of, uh, of precedence, of architectural precedence for um, a language, a sober language for um, a, a, a monumental urban architecture. Um, I think uh, that Saarinen was, was in, inventing a new but um, one looks at, uh, at Corbett's fascination with the, the next place, with uh, Solomon's Temple, um, and you can, you, can, you can see this um, sort of attachment that he's got to historical uh, models at the same time that he seems to be um, talking about, uh, about defining an architecture for his, for his, his own age. Um, the next place. At, woo! <laughs> Okay, there and there. So um, Ferris's rendering from a series of twelve drawings that he created for Corbett um, and uh, this uh, John Wesley Kelchner, the doctor who was responsible for the um, the um, 
uh, euphoric vision of, of Solomon's temple. Um, and you see it here in its very Hollywood version um, rendered by Ferris in the next uh, in a series of, uh, of images that some of you have seen before that seem to be right out of Cecil B. DeMille's uh, intolerance with the plumed fans and dancing girls. Um, the next place and casts of thousands. Um, the next place. Uh, and you know this this is an archaeological drawing um, that uh, that both Corbin and Ferris probably knew uh, with um, I think the Tower of Babylon in the background uh, and the hanging gardens of Babylon, which was the, a phrase that was often used to evoke the um, recommendation for garden terraces and penthouse uh, plazas or uh, penthouse terraces and 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 rooftop gardens um, that one. Uh, one read about uh, in the in the, the visionary writings of, of the 1920s. Um, these uh, archaeological um, images um, s sort of make the the connection that um, that many of the architects used to to validate the idea of of a, of a, of a civilized um, precedent for. Uh, New York's new architecture, the I mean, historical precedent. The next, please. Uh, New York of tomorrow, and so another one. Uh, so from the the two poles of uh, Corbett's imagination, the Temple of Solomon on the one hand, the Titan City on the other, both happening in the same year in 1925. When um, Corbett and Ferris came together um, again, when actually Corbett uh, called in Ferris uh, to say, well, I've, got, I've gotten an inquiry from uh, the John Wanamaker store. They want to have a big uh, pageant. It was called the, the um, Historical Pageant of, uh, of New York, um, the Tercentennial Pageant of New York, the 300th anniversary, where the Wanamaker store um, hung throughout the, uh, their, their two stores. Uh, murals that were a tribute to the history of the city but were all but also had this aspect of the futurism the di the direction of New York of tomorrow um, and the impresario for that effort was uh, Corbett and as he wrote to, to Ferris um, about the possibilities of the commission he says you know finally I think we can get somebody to pay for the visionary ideas or these futuristic ideas that you and I have discussed uh, and um, so uh, Ferris reprises a lot of the drawings that he's already made and published in other um, in other um, places. Uh, Corbett's uh, traffic studies are shown in the next next place, both in Ferris drawings um, and also in a section on the regional plan that was part of a gallery in the in the. Um, in the department store, and then a series of drawings of Corbett's ideas by another uh, delineator, Robert Chandler, um, and w you, where you can see that um, the the um, inspired poetry of, of Ferris um, does. It, it, um, is, is absent, uh, and there's these rather um, cruder representations, um, but certainly expressing the monumental ambitions that uh, that that Corbett uh, described for the Titan City. The next next place is a series of them. Um, the the drawings are I think are lacking in um, in both passion and talent, but they describe these same ideas um, that that uh, Corbett and Ferris had collaborated on. The next place. So you just see see them in this um, in a slightly uh, with a, with a slightly different hand. The next place, but you can see how serious Corbett was in trying to advance um, these to um, a wide audience of the many thousands of people that would have uh, would have seen them when they visited the Wanamaker store down on Ninth and Tenth and Broadway. And the next place. Um, also part of the Titan City was a, a series of um, future uh, sort of airport um, images. Uh, the Airport of the Future was a competition that was run in, in the, um, the, uh, st the student ateliers uh, um, that were connected to the Ecole des Beaux-Arts, the, the Beaux-Arts Institute of Design. And uh, Corbett's uh, students from uh, Columbia and elsewhere uh, invented some of these um, solutions for um, skyscraper uh, landing pads for, uh, for small airplanes, the, the next place. So the urban airport, and there were a whole series of these part of the, um, the related uh, exhibition um, and, a, and a competition that was, that was separate but was featured at the Titan City show. The next place. 
um, and the next. And um, these, uh, the continuing discussion that I mentioned here in this case, it's sort of waged in the New York Times and in a series of formal debates in, in, a, in public forums uh, about the advocacy of the skyscraper. Um, you can see that in the next, please, uh, um, with Thomas Hastings um, being against and Harvey Corbett being for. Um, also, the politician Curran was uh, the, the principal spokesperson uh, for um, trying to put a cap on skyscraper height. Um, and in this series of, of debates, public debates in 1925, 26, and 27, uh, Corbett really became sort of the chief uh, 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 orator and uh, uh, sort of uh, rhetorical um, speaker that was identified with the um, this, the, um, the skyscraper city and the pro the um, issue of congestion, the relationship of congestion um, and skyscrapers. Um, the next, please. Just so you see some of those examples. Um, he. Um, he wrote about them at great length, but I think I'll, I'll um, spare you some of, some of those and, and move on to the um, through the uh, later um, tw uh, the later part of his career in, in the 20s, uh, when as you saw um, this image already, but you can see how close it is to another that was part of um, a, an exhibition at uh, the Macy, Macy's the department store, an international exhibition of architecture where Corbett lectured about the city of the future and the multiple levels of, of transportation. Um, the next, please. Uh, and you can see um, here, uh, too, uh, from another article from the American City, so the planning journal, um, a drawing that was done, as it's described um, for by Corbett, is visualized by uh, Harvey Wiley Corbett, um, but by um, a collaborator, uh, Walter Oltarjevsky, a, a Russian um, artist, um, that, um, that who, who drew um, a series of, again, setback skyscrapers, um, elevated uh, bridges, highways in the air, swarming uh, airplanes. Uh, and in this case, these are supposed to be skyscrapers which are m brightly colored and, mu and multicolored. Uh, the, the captions that describe them uh, weren't written by Corbett and, and um, are, are rather sarcastic in, um, in describing the sort of uh, overarching ambition and the, and the, um, the fearful congestion that cities um, uh, that look like this might have, uh, might have produced. The next, please. Um, so that the, this, the, 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 um, the debate over the skyscraper and congestion in the New York Times and all of these, uh, these other venues um, it became a kind of cause celeb in which Corbett was identified with uh, the technocratic solution and the, sky and the skyscraper's um, solution. He would solve traffic congestion through skyscrapers, and he argued that skyscrapers actually um, eased congestion rather than, um, than created it. Uh, the next, please. So we've, we've seen this series of drawings. There's a, um, a slightly different one um, from the same um, series where you can see uh, the difference between where Corbett, uh, where Ferris um, draws uh, the monumental and romantic um, v vision of the setback skyscraper city and this uh, uh, more um, highly uh, detailed um, masonry architecture that's just sort of a, a little um, uh, sort of, uh, I don't know, uh, sort of finicky and, uh, and unconvincing, um, not the, this, uh, you know, the sort of sfumato romance of, uh, of the, the um, monumental um, urban, uh, the monumental metropolis that it was, was um, so convincing uh, when Ferris was able to collaborate with, with these other uh, artists, that you, the whole sequence that you've seen, um, where Corbett um, selected someone else to, to, to render his vision, uh, the, the drawings become uh, either kinds of cartoons or they look like they belong to, more to 19th century um, ideas and the, the um, vehicle for communication that Corbett Im 
embraced most, uh, most um, uh, um, avidly in his career was talking rather than, than, than visualizing. When he worked with, with, with Ferris, he was an incredibly effective communicator, or his ideas were, were communicated very effectively. Um, when he worked with others, they seemed to fall, fall flat. Um, and um, not get the kind of um, exposure and, and serious um, reception by critics. Um, the next, please. Uh, and uh, again, working with Ferris um, in a project that Ferris very much admired, but which was never realized, the Belden project. He talked um, about the architect's idea of architecture as, as mass, um, as a, 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 a sculptural study of uh, a unity between the square base and the rising tower and a series of receding angles. Um, the next, please. And this idea of architecture as mass that I, I read you a quote of uh, before uh, as being the principal uh, project of, uh, of modern uh, design for the skyscraper is something um, that's uh, talked about throughout the 1920s and is defined by people like Sheldon Cheney or Douglas Haskell, the critic from the architectural um, record that talked about um, the, an aesthetic of mass being the prevailing um, central idea of, the, of skyscraper design for those, those are architects and artists who embrace modernism. Um, and the new world architecture is simply another way of saying modernism. The next, please. Um, the the uh, skyscrapers that uh, Corbett did design in the late 1920s are are, um, are fairly few. Um, I think they're they're very good, uh, but they but when they are created in 1928 and 29, like the Master Apartments here on the 103rd and. Um, and Riverside Drive, um, they're uh, as buildings in uh, in uh, brick. Um, they are uh, they 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 have a, a, a they ha well they their their modernity has uh, is has already been passed by uh, the the sweep of. Uh, Art Deco of the um, early international style. They represent a, a kind of safe modernism, I think, by the late 1920s. That, um, while very pleasing um, as uh, as art um, as examples of Art Deco, they they don't they're not at the leading edge of design as if uh, they were. Um, uh, had been built back in when Fer when Corbett was calling for, for um, such design in 1923 and 1924. Um, so these other the next few we see there there are the um, wraparound uh, uh, windows that are sort of a, a nod to European modernism. The next place. Uh, and here in, in this view, which makes the building look much more mountainous and, and massive, like a mass that's uh, carved of, of clay or of stone. Uh, the master apartments uh, were, in the next place, uh, a, a very interesting um, commission for a, um, uh, a, 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 an artist's colony, in effect, that combined a uh, studio apartments for artists, uh, a theater, uh, an artist club, uh, and a museum to the uh, um, the mystic artist Nicholas Rorick. Uh, and the design of the tower has some numerology involved in it, in drawings that um, that I've seen at uh, at Avery, and so it has a um, a lot of mystery to it. I, I forgot to mention before also that um, that Corbett was a, a Mason, and um, the Masonic code seems to uh, then a connection to the Solomon's Temple. Commission. So there's a, there's this, this sort of mysterious um, mystique of uh, of the Mason that sort of uh, that uh, um, ha that, that has a, a kind of light motif of his interest across a whole series of, of commissions. Um, in Art Deco terms, one sees a, a lot um, in the 20s the kind of modulation of the brickwork where there's uh, a, a darker or warmer brick at the top and a beige and lighter one to look, make the building look like it's rising in, into, the, um, into the light or into the sunshine um, that's uh, taken over mostly from German architecture, German expressionist architecture of the period. Uh, the next, please. 
uh, and um, seen sort of straight up the, uh, the facade from the drive, and you can see the wraparound windows that are um, a nod to the um, European style, international style modern. Next, please. Uh, the Huvers rendering of the master apartments. Um, and the next, please. Uh, and a similar um, mountainous kind of, of mass, uh, the one Fifth Avenue building, that's a, another one of these apartment towers, uh, that, um, and the next, please, uh, that describe um, the, uh, the, the rather um, conservative uh, um, identity of, of some of Corbett's uh, late 1920s buildings. Um, Next, please. And um, then to just to continue with a, a, a kind of um, uh, potpourri of inspirations uh, and, uh, and encouragements that Ferris gave to uh, a, a number of different people who were trying to solve the, the problem of traffic congestion. There was a man named Robert Lafferty, and uh, he um, imagined a whole whole series of inventions of connecting skyscrapers at their upper stories uh, and um, separating uh, pedestrians and, and vehicles uh, um, or separ separating the different levels of rail and making these uh, uh, skyscrapers the kinds of depots that connected the, uh, the um, waterborne traffic, the rail, um, and, um, and rapid transit. Uh, the next, please. Um, th this is uh, a drawing from uh, uh, that's uh, signed by Corbett. Uh, that's from the Lafferty plan, or it's in the file in, in the Corbett files, and, and uh, it's reproduced in the Lafferty plan. Uh, never got very far. The Lafferty plan is, is or resides just in, the, um, in, a, in a paper copy in the New York Public Library. The next, please. Uh, and then um, more writings of the visions of uh, a future uh, midtown and a, a description of New York of the future that I think is probably as astute, and I'm going to um, uh, close quickly with this in its connection to Rockefeller Center, um, that this is as, as astute about the, the nature of New York um, back in the 1920s and, and predicting what the future of New York would be in, in a time um, like ours as any that you, um, that, that you can read of the period. Um, he's, he, uh, Corbett writes um, with, I think, great um, insight that cities, uh, cities, are, are, cities are built because people like to be together, he, he maintained. They are manifestations of the group instinct. Face-to-face -face meetings remain essential for modern business because in, in spite of the telephone, the radio, the television, uh, the television uh, businesses still depend on personal contacts. And because nearer a man's office, the nearer a man's office is to those with whom he does business, the more effective are his efforts, the less he loses time and energy. He talks about face-to-face -face, um, meetings. Um, he talks about um, the skyscraper reduces excessive travel and decreases traffic between individual buildings during the workday. An intelligent solution to the remaining surface congestion might be found in creating concentrated skyscraper centers which unite business and residents. A building group whose base will occupy um, three city blocks is actually being constructed in New York. He's talking about Rockefeller Center. And what is even more significant is the fact that the group building is designed especially to house a single industry, that is radio, um, and allied interests. In New York, finance, law, and garment trades have long found it economically advisable to locate in, in distinct sections of the city, to proceed a step further and to introduce apartment dwellings into the tops of gigantic skyscrapers whose lower stories would be filled with office space um, may, be the, may be the next innovation. So when he looks at a vision of Midtown New York, he imagines these, these um, skyscraper megastructures with um, mixed use or horizontal zoning with, the, uh, with apartments and offices above, with shopping and traffic below. Um, he uh, imagines really a, a, a city that, um, that is intensely urban uh, in, in, uh, in terms of increasing congestion and population. Um, but the, 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 he says that that's the nature of the city. The next, next please. 
Um, and um, as he looked at, looks at the future of the skyscraper, he makes the argument for um, congestion. Next, please. Uh, and in um, in the in his designs in collaboration with Raymond Hood, and here's Corbett, um, and the architects of Rockefeller Center, he makes the the most um, extreme proposals for uh, for piling the most possible program onto the site. Um, the next, please. Uh, he has a, a series of drawings that Ferris renders for him for the architects, the original um, uh, competition com uh, the competition for, for Rockefeller Center that, um, and then he becomes an, an advisor on it, but he imagines um, this very densely packed site, um, the next please, with open plazas like he envisioned back in 1923 um, to 24, uh, an art center that would have had the Metropolitan Opera, that would have had um, a big public plaza as a, as a central place, but be surrounded by these commercial buildings um, of mixed use. Um, and the next please. Uh, and densely packed onto the site in his plaster model for the Rockefeller um, Center uh, complex that you see here, which is much more densely built than the um, than the actual um, building, uh, the actual complex would would ultimately be designed. Um, so he was this the the prophet of congestion and intensity, the celeb this. Uh, celebrant of, uh, of the city in its mixed uses, um, in its eye-to-eye -eye contact, its face-to-face -face meetings. Um, the next, please. Uh, and um, in, in this period, in the 20s, there was, there was really nobody more than Corbett who, um, who advocated for, uh, for the, the city as, as the, the, the kind of engine of uh, modernity. And he imagined that the materials of modernism like glass could um, reinvent um, skyscrapers in the next place. Uh, he, um, he imagined, uh, wasn't, a, wasn't a terribly serious proposal on, on the part of, uh, of metropolitan life, but a uh, hundred stories um, skyscrapers uh, in uh, glass and uh, in this case metal uh, spandrels, so the vision of a sign of uh, crystal tower. Uh, the next place. So, so um, he had at the um, end of his, the the tw end of the twenties uh, this kind of concentrated culmination of the idea of um, the city as 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 piled up, as intensified, as stratified by a series of uses as um, necessary for uh, for 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 modern life. Uh, and when um, in uh, 1929 he wrote the entry for the Encyclopedia, Encyclopedia Britannica on architecture, um, he asked Hugh Ferris to render um, a, the future city. Uh, and, um, and, and there you see these kind of uh, uh, pyramids uh, and towers uh, that combine uh, the intense occupation of, uh, of metropolis like uh, New York uh, with, um, with the people packed onto the site in, their, in the mixed uses of business and residence, uh, of the smooth flow of traffic, of all of these ideas that he had um, investigated um, from the early 1920s and that he had been the first um, to imagine um, and to visualize through his um, collaborator Ferris. Um, the next please and I think the last, um, or second last. Um, he worked also on another progressive project, the Century of Progress um, uh, exhibition in 1933 in Chicago. They started working on it before the depression but of course the, the um, uh, by 1933 it was uh, the depths of the de of depression. Um, the plans for skyscraper um, uh, uh, exhibition pavilions um, were were somewhat um, modified by the uh, um, by the evolving reality of the early 1930s. But as you can see, there's a kind of of international style modernism which is is taken um, taken over. Um, the next, please. And as I read to you before, um, he he wrote of the 19. 32 exhibition, or he, he responded to it that he felt a, a little bit um, like someone who uh, of a past generation. That these the ideas that were being advanced seemed to him um, entirely new, and he didn't he didn't grasp them um, all um, that clearly yet. Uh, he, um, he he also. Um, 
he, he also re oddly rejected um, the skyscraper in, um, in the later, after the Depression, seems to have been depressed by the de Depression, and, and had a kind of, um, of remorse um, about his advocacy of uh, the intense urban environment. By, and by 1941, he wrote, strangely, um, that the importance of the skyscraper he, um, is an open question. Uh, um, and that he noted that it was that um, he had recently concluded uh, that the efficiency is not necessarily the most important thing in existence. Referring to two t recently completed high rises, most likely is Metropolitan Life Annex and or the um, Manhattan Criminal Courts buildings that he did in the later um, 30s. He commented, um, perhaps these were to these were to be the last of those multi-storied monstrosities that we Americans um, seem to be so proud. Um, in another interview, he, he declared, no more, no more skyscrapers. They are not necessary from any point of view. 1941, um, he seems to have rejected everything that um, he advocated um, in the 20s. Um, he died in 1952, and he remained very active um, through his life. He seems to have been um, not only um, converted by the experience of uh, the uh, Depression, but also um, by World War II um, and bombing of, of cities seems to have affected his um, belief of the concentration of people in, in one place. Um, so the, so this, this arc of importance that he um, played in the American um, architectural invention of, of um, modernism through the urban model of the skyscraper and of solving the city's problems through a concentration of, um, of technology and planning um, is something that seems unique to his experience of the 1920s um, and something that he that um, like oddly uh, um, too uh, like uh, Ferris rejected um, in the years after the depression so um, it's a, it, it's a, um, a, a moment, I think, um, the 1920s in American architecture where the optimism about um, the city, where the sort of endless ambition and invention um, that these architects um, felt that they could, uh, that they could, they could marshal um, really represented um, uh, this sort of bright and shining moment um, in, uh, in American architecture. Uh, and um, and was was passed by um, by the um, by the events of history, of course, um, by the depression, by the world war, and by um, a, an idea of modernism, which w ultimately was triumphant, the international style imported from a European base um, that was both stylistic and socialistic in its. Um, in its origins, so um, so this this moment of, of the 1920s that's represented so beautifully um, in the imagery and the collaborations of Corbett and Ferris um, in the um, and uh, as we'll look at um, next time with the um, the exuberant in, inventions um, and the business acumen that uh, that Raymond Hood have, I think Mark. Um, a, an episode in American architecture that has been too little explored in detail, um, but which, um, in many ways, is um, is a moment which is um, is is isolated um, in time. Uh, and uh, Corbett is is one of the, um, the the least appreciated of the inventors of that um, that moment of uh, of exuberance. So that's what I think about, <laughs> about Corbett. <laughs>